My name is Dan Papandrea. I'm the director of open source ecosystem um, and community for a company called Sysdig. I also have a show called The Popcast. Um, if you all have seen it, it's pretty good, I guess. Um, we're going to talk today. This is the first cloud native eBPF day. Um, we have an, a great, great set of, uh, of talks, wonderful talks that's going to help you understand this magic that is enhanced Berkeley packet filtering. I'm going to hand it over to my man, Duffy, to talk a little bit more about the tech and what's going on today. Hey, everybody. I'm Duffy Cooley. I'm Maui Lion Online. I'm, uh, I spent a lot of time in networking computers. Oh, no mic. Hello. Hey, that's better. Hey, everybody. I'm Duffy Cooley. I'm Maui Lion Online. I'm also a, a, a blogger and a vlogger and that kind of thing. I do a lot of um, broadcasts on Kubernetes and, and now on eBPF every Friday at 2 p.m. We do an echo office hours where we're talking about some eBPF project or another, or just you know exploring some new uh, exploring some new aspect of the technology. It's but it's a really great series, and so if you're interested in eBPF, definitely check it out. Um, I'm here to kind of talk a little bit about the technology and kind of get everybody excited about what we're here to do. I, I'm actually really excited to see what you are all here to to, to learn. Uh, we have a number of really great presentations coming up today. Um, for my part, the thing that I think attracts me the most to the eBPF space is that it thinks about, it, it gives us the ability to think about kind of the, the problem of networking, of events, of understanding profiling, of understanding, you know, just context and, and information about what processes are running and those sorts of things in a way that we've just never had, certainly not integrated in the way that we do now. So that's the piece that I think is, is probably really driving me. Um, and just the fact that it's, you know, it's superpowers, right? You have the, everything from the ability to profile applications and spend and understand where those applications are spending their time to really making very, you know, complex decisions about how to handle routing, whether to route, to, whether to route like memcache to a local memcache process for any process running. I mean, I just saw the, the incredible paper from Orange on that. It's just a lot of really great stuff happening out there. So I'm, 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 I hope that you're all really looking forward to this session. So without further ado, everyone, um, we are going to have this panel. In our first panel, we have why everyone is excited about eBPF. And again, this day that when we were putting together this day, we wanted this to be you, for you all to look at this technology, a lot of the magic that's here, and be able to apply this to your day-to-day -day from a networking perspective, from a security perspective, from a troubleshooting perspective, from a debugging perspective. So again, first panel is um, we have going to introduce to the stage first the matriarch, Sarah Navadi. Welcome, Sarah. I guess we have a mic for you there. Um, next on the stage, which we have some remote folks. I don't know if you know the, those two faces over there. I don't know. They know a little bit about eBPF, I guess, a little, right? Um, coming to the stage, we also have one of the creators of uh, Wireshark and Sysdig. This is Loris Digiani. Did I get your name right? Yeah, All right, good, good. Next to the stage, we have the consigliere, Andy Randall from Microsoft. All right, and live via satellite, we have Liz Rice and Thomas Groff. Hello. Hello, everybody. So I'm going to ask the first question, and we can go around the horn here. Why are you all excited uh, for eBPF in cloud native? Let's start with the matriarch. Here you go. Yeah. Use that one. Hello. Uh, why is it that we're excited about EPF, eBPF? Uh, giving access safely and securely to kernel capabilities has always been a challenge, and eBPF has started to allow us all sorts of really interesting ways to do this safely. And we, I have to say we're happy to have exciting, interesting ways to evolve this. And Loris can tell us more about it. Why are you so excited about it? 
Um, does this work? Check. No, I think it works. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, we're making the. <laughs> we're making my, it up as my, we go my along. Check. Um, to me, uh, so clearly the, the Linux kernel is uh, the underlying engine for for cloud native, uh, and Linux in general, you know, is is the operating system that uh, runs our workloads, our our applications. Uh, in, in in the cloud, and uh, eBPF makes it programmable, which is incredibly powerful. It's like uh, you know the underlying engine that is powering our car is uh, we can open the hood and in a safe way essentially work on it and uh, and make it more more powerful, extend it in incredible ways. Uh, I come from um, my previous. Uh, 10 years uh, where uh, the, the first 10 years of my career were in networking and uh, uh, packet capture in particular. So I come from the age of the old BPF without without the E. And and, and that was already e exciting about that uh, at the time when you could filter packets, you know, with, uh, with, with the virtual machine. And what you can do today, you know, the power, the tooling around it, the programmability is just incredible for, for somebody that we witnessed the evolution and uh, yeah, uh, super excited uh, about what's happening. So, so we're gonna kick it over to our live via satellite. We'll have Liz speak and uh, about what she thinks is super exciting for eBPF and cloud native. And uh, then Thomas, if you'd like to add uh, points as well. So I think building what the previous speakers have already said, the really interesting thing is that there is one kernel per host. When we have a cluster of machines, each machine is only running one host. And that means we can instrument all of the application code that's running on each host with one set of eBPF programs. We only have to apply our instrumentation, whether that's for observability or networking or security, we can apply that to each host rather than having to worry about instrumenting each individual application. And I think that's why specifically for cloud native, this is a really interesting technology. Yeah, I think those are all great points. First of all, hello. Uh, as you can see, I, I'm calling you from the mountains here. Um, it's, it's, it's nice and cold. I'm are those super, Swiss mountains, I, Thomas, are those Swiss it, mountains? It is, they, they are, they are. Yeah. This is actually the most famous North Face in Switzerland. I can see in the background. Like for all the mountaineers and climbers out there, that's kind of the dream. So I'm, I've been involved from the EBPF since the early days, 2014, and EBPF is just massive, right? I think before working on EBPF, I was working at Red Hat doing Windows kernel development, and um, we tried to kind of predict what, what customers and users would eventually need from the Linux kernel. And, and why? Because it took so long for a Linux kernel version to get into the hands of the users, multiple years, right? You would not run the latest bleeding edge kernel um, if, you, if, you're, if you're like a, um, a production level user. So that meant that you would you would would take years for a kernel development feature to get into the hands of users. With eBPF, this is now different. Like we can now reprogram, change the behavior, and as Sarah noted, in a safe way. That's so crucial because technically this was possible before with Linux kernel modules, but with the potential to crash your kernel, right? Nobody wants that. eBPF gives us this sandboxed ability to run programs, very 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 similar to how a web browser. Uh, allows to allow, allows extension of JavaScript. Like think back pre-JavaScript when you had to install new versions of a web browser in order to view certain websites. We were basically there with with, uh, with, with standard operating systems, and with eBPF, all of a sudden we can innovate because we can get a kernel change into the hands of users within hours or or, or days. So we can use the the significant um, like the, 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 the high strategic ground of an operating system that can see and control everything and actually innovate. And that's just fascinating. Uh, and I think we'll see a ton of open source projects make, make, um, make, make use of that. And finally, sir, Andy Randall. Yeah, um, I think all great points. I'd like to kind of step back a bit and, and say, this is really about speed and the speed at which we can move. Um, you know, if you look at the pace of innovation that's happening in cloud native, how frequently Kubernetes releases are coming out, how many new features are in them, how quickly new projects are getting created around them. Um, you know, we're moving at an incredible pace. The Linux kernel can't do that. 
It, it shouldn't it, it do moves, that. It shouldn't do that. Yeah, it needs to be the stable basis on which on which we're building. You know, and I remember in the early days of Kubernetes networking, uh, you know, a lot of people were still on very old kernels in the early day, early days of Kubernetes, and we just couldn't get the performance out of out of the kernel, just because of they hadn't got all of the latest IP sets, IP tables, kind of capabilities. And yeah, the kernel got there eventually, but we need to keep moving forward at a, at a pace that the kernel is not going to keep up with. And and that's what eBPF does, is it allows us to innovate at the kernel level at the same pace that we're doing in, in cloud native. Um, so so that's, that's one key piece. And another key piece is, is it gives us this visibility and observability capabilities and ability to actually debug and handle things at scale um, where in, in the past, you know, it's fine if you're debugging a single machine, that's one thing. But if you've got a cluster, a problem that's happening cluster wide, these problems to um, troubleshoot in production get really, really tough. And eBPF gives you this kind of visibility. Um, I, rem I remember at Kinfolk, we had a customer where they had, they, they came to us with like a CPU, you know, throttling performance issue in their Kubernetes clusters. These were smart people and they'd been spending like three months trying to get to the bottom of this issue. We came in and with some eBPF tooling, like basically in a day, said, okay, here's, here's the issue and solved it for them. And they couldn't believe it. And it wasn't because we were much smarter than them. It was just, we had these eBPF tools. And you know, so I, I think those are kind of two really crucial uh, pieces that play to cloud native. With that, I mean, we've all, and the solutions are for, and all, from all of these sponsors that have been here have, have kind of embedded eBPF in our tools, right? If you think about Isoval and uh, Azure, excuse me, Microsoft, uh, Sysdig, and and Tigera, there's solu the solutions are and basically doing that had made this bet on eBPF, right? So I kind of want to ask the question here, and I'm looking at my notes, y'all. Sorry. Uh, so um, in terms of the EB eBPF and your individual solutions, why did you go with eBPF? I'll start with Loris. I, I kind of know the backstory. I kind of want you to share it with everybody else. Though. Yeah, you, you you can say the story if you want. <laughs> uh, so, uh, SysDig, both from uh, the uh, open source point of view, in particular with Falco, uh, which does essentially runtime security for cloud native applications, and also with uh, the company's uh, commercial products that are based around it, uh, we uh, decided right away with, to go with kernel instrumentation. So, there are uh, multiple ways that essentially you can instrument for security, in particular for the like the deep kind of visibility that you need for runtime security or for threat hunting. And uh, one thing that Liz said that uh, I, I agree very much with is uh, uh, the kernel of the operating system, especially from the point of view of, of, of security instrumentation, gives a big advantage because it's essentially uh, big O one instead of big O N, where N is the number of processes, containers, applications that, that you're running on the machine. So uh, it, it's just much simpler and much higher performance to instrument with the kernel of the operating system. When SysDig started, eBPF was uh, still not uh, uh, in the, in the uh, operating system kernel. A actually, when we also when we released Falco in 2016, those were the very, very early days of eBPF. And, uh, when we started looking at the technology and, and how it was evolving inside the kernel, we were like, that's it, you know? That's, that's how this should be done, you know? So forget about uh, kernel modules uh, and, uh, and, and everything that has to do with essentially executing components inside the, inside the Linux kernel. And, uh, you know, this is the perfect solution. It's sandboxed, it's safe, it's secure, it's verified, and it's high performance. So, essentially very, very early days, we decided to bet on this and we never looked back and, and we're still not looking back. He went away a summer in Italy and came back and there was Falco. So, all right, so uh, <laughs> next I want to ask uh, Thomas and Liz, um, you know, that same question, like why did you make this bet on eBPF for, you know, Cilium and, and um, you know, Isovalent? Should I go for Should I go first, Liz? I think you know the history, so you should definitely answer this one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for us, the story is even simpler. Right? We basically, I think, created huge portions of eBPF to then create Cilium. Right? So everything we have built on Cilium, whether it's the networking pieces, the security pieces, the observ observability pieces, they're all done based on eBPF. Um, so on purpose, like the entire reason why Cilium exists is we did not want to create yet another net network observability and security solution that just bases on 
existing Linux kernel abstractions, but instead start with something completely new, eBPF-based, that, as Andy mentioned really, really well, and is able to cope with the pace of cloud native because it's still evolving very, very, very quickly. There's a couple of pieces that are truly super interesting. I think that make eBPF an obvious choice. On the networking side, it's all about abstracting away and caring less about traditional networking, actually. Like end users, users, they care about services, connectivity, regardless in which cloud it is running, or whether it's on-prem, whether it's in a public cloud and so on. That requires like the Linux networking layer or Linux networking in general to understand containers, services, API protocols, and so on. On the security side, it's all about deep understanding of the system, really understanding what workload is actually, for example, making a network call. It's not just about understanding which part. You actually might want to understand the difference whether this is the actual workload or whether this is an application developer running kube control exec and running a bash or something like that. And on the observability side, yes, you still want some level of traditional network observability, but you also want the application protocol parsing. You need DNS understanding and so on, right? And EBPF is perfect because it allows, uh, it basically allowed us to build a high scale, highly efficient network observability and security solution that can then keep up with the pace and is not bound to some use case that we defined a couple of years ago when we, when we actually started. So we can continue to innovate and meet the latest end, end user asks basically. So it's been great. And I think um, definitely would definitely do it again to kind of extend uh, EBPF to then start, uh, to then start um, Cilium. Liz, do you, you want to add something? I think the only thing I would maybe add was a little story um, that Daniel Bookman, who's a kernel maintainer and he's in our team. And um, this is really just a, a little bit of an aside around kind of how Cilium and eBPF kind of developed hand in hand. And I remember asking him about XDP and he was talking about how like it was Kind of well it would be kind of cool if we could run ebpf programs on the network card and you know that turned into reality so you know this ability to innovate this ability to pull things like essentially kernel functionality into network cards you know there's a i feel like that's a very strong example of innovation and change that's being driven starting from this ebpf community so we have five minutes uh, here, uh, I think three minutes at this point, but um, I want to go into Q&A, but I want to ask this question kind of a lightning round, okay, real quick. So the question is, is, you know, what do you see, this is, I can't believe I'm making this question a lightning round, but what do you see for the future of like, you know, eBPF in your individual solutions? Just give us like a, a an ele elevator, maybe you want to go first, uh, Sarah? Sure. So the elevator pitch from Microsoft, because I get to do this occasionally, is we're making a big bet on eBPF because we think it's very important and it's one of those technologies can, that can help us leapfrog and innovate. And that is very much the space we're doing it to the point that we've brought this Linux concept out to the Windows environment. And that, and we're, we're going ahead and learning and cross-pollinating that way. It was almost lightly. By the way, how awesome are Sarah's shoes? I just want to throw that out there. All right. Loris? Um, from the point of view of Falco, I think that uh, the way I see uh, eBPF support evolving is uh, in, in Falco and security in general, I think that uh, uh, more hooking points, more places where you can fetch essentially relevant data, relevant information, security signals, from the kernel of the operating system, Linux security modules, for example, is a good example, and in a general way broadening that. And from the vertical point of view, offering interfaces that uh, uh, can be um, clean and, and powerful for the specific use cases that maybe have to do with security. For example, one thing that we did early in the year with Falco, we donated the libraries for uh, that, that are essentially wrap uh, our uh, eBPF probe uh, wrap around our eBPF probe offering essentially high level state enhancement uh, and, and decorations and stuff like that. So that's another direction where I see the community going essentially with uh, higher level uh, abstractions uh, around eBPF to make it even easier to use. Hell of an elevator. Over to you, sir, Andy or Aunt Randall. Yeah, I'll try and keep this quick. So um, actually for, for those who don't know, I'm with Kinfolk team. We were recently acquired by Microsoft. So we have um, kind of insight both from what we were doing at Kinfolk, where we had an um, eBPF project around Kubernetes called Inspector Gadget that took a lot of the traditional um, uh, host-based BPF tools 
and allowed you to deploy them in a Kubernetes environment. So we're going to be doing a lot more of that, taking many more tools and basically anything you could do on a host with eBPF, with the VCC tools and those kind of things, you'll be able to do in a Kubernetes in environment. So that's one thing. And then the other is we're just working across a lot of different teams within Microsoft. Um, and there's a, a lot of different applications and, and innovation happening internally, which will see its way out into AKS and, and you know, and, the, the, the un, you know, the, the, everything that underlays um, the services that we're deploying. So I think there's going to be a lot more that you'll see coming out of us. And if you haven't played with a flag car, please do. It's pretty cool. It's really cool. All right. Um, lastly, uh, Thomas and, and Liz, again, elevated, and then we're going to go into some Q&A. So Duffy will have the uh, microphone around to ask some, anybody asking any questions. But go ahead, uh, Thomas or Liz, want to end, end up. Yeah, also, we're, we're really looking... We're really looking forward to working with the Microsoft team to port Cilium to Windows. So I think that's a great step forward, bringing all the Cilium magic to, to Windows. Um, I think the big one for me will be, and that's, it's basically user, user request. It is. Everybody is screaming for an eBPF-based service mesh today, right? So that was definitely something that we will be looking into. We actually have a lot of this already, and a lot of our users are happy with our Layer, layer 7 build balancing security and so on. So I think going further down that road, uh, we're, 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 we're definitely hearing you, and we will try to make it happen like a sidecar free service mesh entirely powered by EBPF. And I think there's lots of obvious small steps that we could talk about deeper security, better understanding where EBPF will make a huge role. But I think the service mesh one is probably one of the, going to be one of our biggest focuses, I would say. All right, we have like a minute, I think, for the QA. Anybody have any questions? I want to add one quick thing to that because Sorry, as, well as, ahead, service mesh, as well as service mesh being you know, potentially sidecarless. I think we're going to see a ton. This isn't just about Cilium. This is about eBPF in general. We're going to see everything being possible to be sidecarless because we can instrument, as I said before, at the host level. Yep. I think that's going to be a big performance improvement. So my question comes from Scaling. What's your name? I'm what? Gabe, by the way. Sorry, I'm a software engineer over at uh, Sneak. Hi, Gabe. Hi. Um, so one of the things we're finding is that our um, the amount of data we collect for observability, especially at scale, is, is something that's a, a bit challenging to deal with. I mean, these are really incredible advances in introspection. But being able to store the information and then make sense of it is at that scale is, is becoming a problem. What do you see as some of the challenges to, to make that easier to work with, not just by exposing the observability, but actually being able to take action off of it. Yeah, I think there's actually a very key answer here that is, is very unique to eBPF. And it's, it's one, of the, one of the reasons why eBPF got started was profiling and tracing. And it was all about removing the requirement to send a lot of data from kernel to user space and then make sense of that. Instead, make the kernel in in intelligent on what type of visibility it should offer. And I think the same applies to what you've just described. That's the solution. Like understanding what is noise and what is real information at the source where it happens and using eBPF for on time to do so. Yeah, I, I tend to agree with that. I think that uh, uh, so e eBPF essentially gives you access to everything essentially in, in the Linux kernel, which is gigabytes per second probably probably of data if you if you if you actually you know collect all of the information but i think the philosophy is and, and, and more and more in the future the philosophy will be based on sort of localized streaming decisions ideally you look at the data and you summarize it in the kernel if, if you cannot do that you do it you enrich it a little bit and you and you take you know like your decision and your you do your observations in the local host and you all, all, only stream in this in a centralized place the summarized data that's that's essentially what eBPF gives you is, is like sort of the ability to program and take decisions as close as possible to the source. And the only way to survive in the data is, is, is really applying this and being close to the source. All right, so I'm sorry. Hey, don't fire me. I have to, I have to cut everybody off. We have to go to the next session. We went a little late, everyone. So um, Duffy, do you want to come up and introduce our next speaker in session? And thank you all. This panel is amazing. Thank you all thank for you. joining also remote, Thomas and Liz.